It is common to work with applications that store data and use popular JPA implementations like Hibernate, Eclipse Link, and many more. What should not be common is that we developers often struggle with many tasks, such as creating or managing JPA model, data repositories, JPA entities, and others. And how can we forget the usual suspect, handling database migrations, or even creating JPA models using existing legacy databases? And you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more issues that we developers struggle with on a daily basis. Do we know how to address all of them? I don't, but our speaker today definitely does. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in for another IntelliJ Idea live stream. I'm your host, Mala Gupta. And now let me add our speaker, Marco Bella, to the stream. Hi, Welcome, Mala. Marco. Welcome, Marco. It's a pleasure to have you present with us today. It is a pleasure to be here, Mala. I'm so looking forward to this, as always. So let, let me quickly introduce you. Marco is my colleague, a fellow developer advocate with Java, uh, with JetBrains, sorry. I'm a Java developer advocate and keep saying Java. <laughs> so Marco is also a great conference speaker and he has a very popular YouTube channel, which is Marco Codes. So Marco, are you missing saying Marco Codes in the beginning of the session? I'm missing saying Marco Codes. That's why I have to do it. So Marco <laughs> Codes today. Yes. Uh. That's amazing. <laughs> so, I know that you are trying. Uh, you will be talking about a lot of features for JPA Buddy so that people can uh, level up from being uh, zero to hero. But I would like to ask you this question: Which is your favorite feature from JPA Buddy? Uh, it, it's an interesting question because there's so many features, and uh, I'm just going to give you a quick teaser because I think. At the end of the day, I like the coding assistance a lot where you literally just write a couple of words and you automatically get repositories, queries, DTOs, everything created for you with very little you know, effort, so to speak. So uh, you'll see it in action. Um, and I would say these, these tiny coding and tiny, the, these great uh, code assistance features are, are, are killer features for me. I... I'm not denying any of this. That was a trick question because this is a question that I always read because people come up to me and they ask Mala, what is your favorite feature in IntelliJ IDEA? And I say, mm, that really depends on what I'm doing because there's so many amazing features in IDEA. <laughs> so I will not take a lot of your time. And I, before I let you take the stage, let me share some quick housekeeping details. Um, Andre, uh, Sergey, so, okay, could we have the slides up so that everyone's watching could see uh, what I'm talking about? Okay, so everyone's watching. They can use the YouTube chat to post your question. We'll try to answer your questions as you post them. We also have Andre with us today who will answer your question. He works with the IntelliJ IDEA team and has been developing various plugins to simplify coding using frameworks like JPA and Spring. We'll also have Andre answering your questions on the stream after Marco is done with his live coding. And uh, the session is being recorded. That is one of the most asked questions. And we'll post this session on IntelliJ Ideas YouTube channel and also on JetBrains Twitch channel. So if you haven't already subscribed to our channels, now is the time to do so. And if you like today's session, which I'm sure you will, do not forget to like the video. And now let me add Marco's screen to the stream. Yes, we go. So, yeah. So, Marco, I'll be backstage. Just call out my name if you need anything and have fun. Thank you, Marla. Thank you. Thank you. I will. Right, folks. Uh, so, we're just going to dive right in. Um, well, we're going to talk about JPA Buddy, the plugin, who would have thought. And as I already kind of mentioned, I think if you're working with JPA slash Hibernate or any JPA provider, so to speak, um, or even just, you know, you want to write DTOs and map them from your entities to your DTOs and work with Spring Data. It is effectively a very, very, very cool and useful plugin. Um, I'm not going to show you any slides to convince you to try out JPA Buddy. As always, what I'm going to do is live coding. So we'll spend the next, I don't know, 40 minutes, 45 minutes uh, doing some JPA body live coding. And at the end of the day, hopefully you can take everything you've seen me do uh, and use it in your own project right after tomorrow, whenever you like.
All right. So what I did is, um, where if people are watching my Marco Codes channel, if not, please subscribe to the channel. Um, I'm having this. I'm, I'm building this Google Photos clone application, right? Where I essentially have a website at the moment, a Spring Boot application, uh, where I can store images and videos in a database. And that's the application we're going to work with, roughly. It's also available online. I will check. Uh, I will post a link to the GitHub repo at the end of the session, so you can clone it. You can repeat everything you saw me do, uh, either with that project or, as I said, with your own project. Now, um, I'm going to go to IntelliJ IDEA and just a couple of prerequisites. Obviously, I have the project checked out. It is a Spring Boot project. It has Spring Data. It has Hibernate slash JPA. Um, it has um, a MySQL database. Doesn't matter. It could be any type of database. MySQL, H2, Postgres, JPA, but it works with every database type uh, that there is out there. And the only thing I did, and you'll have to do, is you'll have to install the JPA Buddy plugin. Uh, so settings, plugins, right? And then on the plugin somewhere here, you'll see JPA Buddy. And uh, just a tiny quick note. If you have IntelliJ IDEA, the community edition, so the free version, you can install the plugin and you'll have a ton of features available. But if you have IntelliJ Ultimate and you install the plugin, you have even more features available. So there's a slight difference between these two um, plugin versions. And I can, I'll try and think of whenever I show you a feature uh, to tell you, hey, this is only available in IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate. And at the end, I'll also try and give you a link uh, to display uh, the differences between these uh, two versions, right? Okay, so I made my project. Um, just to quickly show you my database. Um, the database is very simple at the moment. It only has one table, a media table. The media table has photos, images, movie, movies, all there is. I wanted to make it very simple so you can learn the concepts, understand everything. Later on, go crazy with your own project where you can show to uh, where you can work with 200 database tables right so we're here um, on the left you can see there's at the moment there's only one entity it's the media entity how uh, which maps to to the media table how would i know that jpa body is now enabled is there a specific window do I have some sort of specific actions and this is something um, which threw me off at the very beginning because there's multiple ways uh, to deal with jpa body and i'm just going to quickly show you them and then i'm going to show you my favorite ways and then we'll get finally get going so first of all um if you have hibernate slash any jpa provider in your class path the plugin will automatically be enabled and here on the left, you can see, for example, the JPA Explorer. It's a tiny toolbar, tool window rather, tool panel, which pops up here at the bottom where you can see, hey, uh, here are my persistence units, Hibernate speak for your entities. Uh, what are my database connections? And you have a couple of actions where you can do stuff. Yeah, create new entities, uh, do whatever. That's one way of, the, of, of uh, playing with JPA body. Second, Context dependent, if you have an entity open, for example, my media entity, you will see a nice little toolbar here at the top. Hopefully you can see it on the screen. I'm just hovering around it with my mouse, where you can see I have actions where I can add entity attributes, where I could add lifecycle callback methods, ind indices and whatever, yeah, named queries. And we'll have a look at these uh, shortly. That's another way. On the right here, you have a so-called toolbar, which is called JPA Designer. It gives me flashbacks to Delphi. I don't know if, if any of you worked with Delphi before, a long time ago. But essentially, these actions that you can see here at the top, they are the same actions you can see here in the toolbar. So you can add attributes, for example, to entities. You can add lifecycle callbacks. And here at the bottom in this panel, you have, for example, all the information about your entity in this case. Uh, for example, is there a parent? Is there a base entity? Is there a specific inheritance schema? All in one place, so you don't have to go, you know, through your uh, to your Java class and you know make a mental model of all the annotations you're using. And last but not least, last way, if you go inside a file, an entity or a repository. Alt insert also gives you options. So alt insert, you know, lets you add the entity attributes and uh, everything you basically can see in the toolbar. So at the moment, there's 
we saw, I think, four different ways of playing with JPA Buddy. Um, we might, I don't even know, uh, you know, improve that in, in, in future versions to make it a bit less multidimensional. But for now, you can choose your favorite one. Uh, I personally like the old insert way. I also like um, actually the toolbar here on the right side. So we'll start with that. Because now enough talking about the basics and the prerequisites and the windows and whatever. We want to get started. So imagine, uh, well, I have my, my media entity slash table. And um, I want to add a new field. And in, in Java speak, I'll just call it, it's going to be a storage enum. Because I want to remember, did my file, my, my image, for example, come from a local hard drive? Did it come from S3? Did it come from Google Cloud Storage? Now I need to you know, get it right. Did it come from Azure? Yeah, and all every other cloud provider there is. So let's just imagine I want to add that enum to my media entity. What I could do, obviously, I could go ahead and, you know, write my field here, private oh, storage rather, and storage, and then think of the right um, annotation. Or what I could do is uh, I'll open up JPA Designer here on the right. I want to add an attribute. I don't want to add an association or a basic type. I'm going to go down to enum. So I'll just double click enum here. And a field pops up, new enum attribute. The type is easy. It's going to be storage. So I see all the enums from my project. The field should be called storage. The enum type should be of type string because by default, I think JPA's default is to store enums as a number in the database, as an ordinal. So I'm just going to go with string here. I could even say, hey, I want to have a specific length, for example, or I want to have it to be unique or a specific JDBC type code, whatever. We don't have to worry about all of that. I just want to click OK for now. Right. And then what I can see is JPA body added, you know, my uh, storage field with the right enumerated annotation, uh, getters and setters. And by the way, if you don't like that, that the getters and setters are being put there, I'm just, I need to put it on. Yeah, let's do a rearrange code. It, it will put the getters and setters in the right place. And off you go. Now, you might be thinking, oh, Marco, that was so simple. That was just, you know, an enumerated field. Um, I could have done it yourself. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I wanted to start with a very basic, basic, super basic example because I want to pick it up a notch now. Imagine we have um, um, a new user entity. Because what I want to have is I want to have a media table and every media table should be, or every media row object should be associated with one specific user. And every user can have many media, medias, I'm not quite sure, media, I think it's just uh, the, the plural, right. So it's a good old one to many, many to one association. Again, what I could do is I could pick up, you know, the Hibernate book, uh, which I always recommend, Java Persistence with Hibernate, the second edition, and think about, hey, which annotation do I need? And uh, do I need to have the reverse mapping somewhere specified? And how does all of that work? Or I'll just use the JPA designer here on the right. I click attributes. I click association, right? And hopefully, let me see, is my ID hanging? Well, if it, if it is, the double click isn't working. So I'll just try it here, right? Association, for whatever reason, I couldn't just click here, maybe because of the zoom level, there was some issue here. Um, I want to add a new association attribute. So I want to have um, from my media entity, an association with a user entity, but that entity doesn't yet exist. So what I can do is I can just click plus here and it gives me a dialogue window saying, hey, let's just create a new entity on the fly. I'm going to call it user entity. It has no parent here. And uh, it has an ID with type long, which is identity, meaning auto generated in the database. I'll just click OK. And here on the left, you can see my entity was already created. Now back in my uh, association window, um, I can see that, hey, yes, I want to have a reference to a user. And then what should it be? Yes, should it be a many to one, a one to many, many to many, one to one. And then what I found super useful because it confused me myself a lot of times now, what is it actually? Many to one, one to many. Thankfully, there's a tiny note below which says, well, many to one means several media objects are associated with zero or one user objects. Yes, that's what I want. 
Then I can go crazy about it being mandatory, unique, the cascade type. Um, let's go to the mapping type. Uh, and that is, if you've worked with JPA before, do I just want to be able to go from media to user, or do I also go want to go from user to all the associated media objects? That is what the bidirectional join column is for, right? And again, I would have to think about, you know, how to map that properly. Here I can, you know, just, you know, tick the right um, radio bu button, I think it is. I'll just click OK for now. Now JPA Buddy asks me, hey, you have this bidirectional relationship. You need an inverse attribute, the one I talked about earlier, right? And I'm going to call it media, right? And I'll just go with the defaults here. You can go crazy with all these options. I'm not going to show you all of them. Um, I'm just going to click OK for now. And let's see what happened. Because what happened is, long story short, in my media entity, we have a new user field. It's a many to one with a join column. That looks good. When I go to my user, I can see that I have, yes, a set of media mapped with this inverse attribute, right? As I want to many. And that is exactly exactly what I wanted. So I didn't have to fumble around with my own mapping and you know making the the annotations work. Uh, instead, I just literally clicked a couple of buttons and checkboxes in a Delphi dialog window. Sorry about that. Uh, and uh, everything was done for me automatically, and it works. When you look at the JPA designer. Um, what you also can do, obviously, you can add these attributes for any type of association, one too many, many too many, and I'm not going to go through any more of these uh, relationships, but literally anything you can map with Hibernate, you can all, you also will find a dialog for that uh, with JPA body. Basic types like, you know, string, whatever, write uh, IDs, embedded IDs, enums, all of that works. Same goes for lifecycle callbacks. I mean, the, this stuff is rather easy. For example, you want to do something after an entity was loaded from the database, um, right? You can write your custom logic here. Same with indices. Um, maybe something, a tiny quick note about name queries. Um, maybe I'll just tease it right away because um, what JPA Buddy comes with is a... I call it Visual Query Designer. And I'm just going to tease it here now, um, where essentially I can say, hey, hmm, or maybe I'll go through it. So imagine I wasn't working with uh, with Spring Data, just with plain JPA slash Hibernate, if any of your of, of, the, of those souls out there are here in this webinar. And if I want to write a name query, imagine I want to write a new, I don't know, I'm going to call it find all uh, custom. Sorry about that. The naming is a bit wacky. And um, I want to add a query condition. I want to say, for example, hey, I want that my file name uh, starts with something, and I want it to be an ignore case query. And additionally, and now the zoom level again comes into play here. That should look a bit better if <laughs> the zoom isn't cranked up so much. Um, and for example, the creation date should be, I don't know, less than something. And then a couple of other options, which I'm going to ignore. I'm going to click OK. Let's see what happens. What happens is that JPA Buddy added a named query with the named queries annotation here on top of my entity. It's called user find all custom. And you can see here is a nice little HQL query. Select you from user in a join media where this is how the uppercase, so the, the ignore casing uh, is, is being implemented. So we just uppercase, upper everything. And um, that's it. You get a nice little HQL query. Yeah, you didn't have to write yourself. Again, you just clicked uh, through a wizard, essentially, and everything was done for you. Right. I'll just quickly comment that out because um, I'm not. I'll, I'll we'll re-implement that again. That very same query later on with Spring Data. Um, but for now, what I wanted you to understand, the first big concept of the JPA Buddy plugin is. When you have it set up in a JPA project, doesn't even have to be a Spring Data project. Then you can do with your entities whatever you like. You can, you know, create, you, you saw me create a, a very simple storage enum. You saw me create associations. They can be as complex as you'd like. 
Uh, you can, you know, create uh, name queries, everything. Let's I would call it entity management. Uh, everything you want to do here, you can do with the with any of the the ways I showed you earlier with JPA body. That's one big, well, let's say conceptual block I wanted to show you. The second big conceptual block. Um, I don't know about you, but out there, it depends a bit on the project, what type of developer you are. Are you a, let's say, Java first programmer? Meaning you just like to write your entities first, and then at some point later on, you update your database tables. Or are you maybe a database first type of person? where you just, um, you know, add maybe new columns first in a database table, and then, you know, later on put them uh, into your entities. And I'm not saying there's a right or wrong way to do it. I personally myself have uh, switched ways uh, over the years. But in any case, we have to kind of sort out um, how do we sync changes from Java code to my database or from my database to Java code. And usually uh, what people nowadays do is they don't just, you know, have plain SQL, you know, uh, change log statements, but they use a tool like Flyaway or Liquibase, for example, um, to somehow, somehow create these, uh, these changes and apply them to a database, maybe even the production database. Now, let's say <clears throat> there is, if you remember me saying at the beginning, uh, JPA buddy uh, kind of scans your class path. And when I do an alt insert here in my, let's see, under resources, because I want, for example, to create some, some database change logs, I don't see specific, um, for example, flyway actions here at the moment. For that, what I want, what I need to do is I need to go to, in this case, my Gradle build file, and I need to put flyway on the class path, right? And as soon as I have flyway on the class path, I get, I can, you know, uh, execute flyway specific actions with JPA buddy. The same would work with Liquibase. Sorry, if you're a Liquibase user, I just wanted to go with flyway, keep it a bit simpler here. Um, but uh, just so you know, that always make sure to remember to refresh your class path uh, as well. And um, at the moment, my database table that I have, it kind of maps. I think if I open it up, you'll see here is my, uh, here is my uh, media table that one tiny table, but now we have a new entity, my user entity. Uh, we have that new field, the storage field. And I would have to rem remember these changes, right? Because at some point I want to merge, for example, my feature branch to the main development line. And then I want to have a change set where I say, hey, I just added these couple of fields. And obviously I could just remember them uh, or I ask JPA, bloody, uh, JPA buddy to help me out. How does that work? Well, what you could do is um, here under resources, now that I added uh, Flyway, you can see there's a new action which is called Flyway version migration. Let's see what it does. And that tiny um, window here has um, quite a bit of power. Let's call it like that. First of all, you can say, hey, what is my actual state of the model. So what did I just develop? Should I have a look at the database? Or should I have a look at all the Java classes, my entities here? For now, I want to go with the model because we just changed the stuff up here in, uh, in my entity classes, in my Java project. Then what do we want to compare this state to, right? So what should the diff be? And the diff in this case should be the database, my database table I have, and I can select, you know, uh, JPA body here. Uh, my connection that I have set up, and I'll quickly tell you in a second what that snapshot here, uh, what that snapshot here does. But I'll just click OK and let's see what happens. So you can see that it took a second, and then here on the left I can see that hey, JPA Birdie says let's create a new migration, where the first part is I want to create a new table called user. That's right, we needed that for our user entity. Then we add a storage field, a column rather, sorry, to my media table. That's right. We also want to add a user ID uh, column to my uh, to, to the media table. And we want to add a foreign key constraint also. We just click save. And once what's happened is I just got, you know, a V1 SQL script here 
uh, a flyway script. I just for Spring Boot, I would have to put it into the DB slash migrations subfolder here on the resources. But you get the idea. Uh, you just got a perfectly valid uh, diff uh, differential change between your model and your database uh, without you having to remember what you effectively changed. And the thing is, by the way, I said at the beginning, there's a difference between the community version or the community edition and the IntelliJ Ultimate Edition. And uh, these differential changes you cannot do with the community edition. Uh, they are only available in IntelliJ IDEA Ultimate, right? Okay, so what you would do is you would go ahead. You can you can you know do as much Java, write as much Java as you write uh, as you want. And the last minute, you just sync with the database, with for example the Dev database or whatever have you, and you'll get the uh, you get the incremental change. Let me just delete that file. Uh, and maybe again, it works with uh, Liquibase. It works also, by the way, if you just write a new uh, SQL file. If you say you're not even using, um, I don't know, Flywheel or Liquibase, you can literally just put, you know, these diff DDLs into a good old SQL file. That also works as well. So um, as always, JPA Buddy doesn't force you into a specific way, but rather tries and work with every tool, technology, framework, language out there that you might be working with. Now, while we're here, there's just one thing I want to mention. I'm not going to show it, but what you could effectively do, it would be super cool, I thought, if you could say, for example, hey, uh, my current state is my model, so it's my entities, and then you compare this state with the model from a different branch, for example. Not go against the DB, but maybe even go against the main branch or some other you know, stable branch to compare it with. There is no such branch selector, but what you can do is actually you can take a snapshot. A snapshot is a specific action. Uh, you can just you know execute uh, in, in in IntelliJ IDEA where it says take a snapshot of um, uh, sorry with JPA body, take a snapshot of my model, and you could do that in a different branch, and then come back right and compare what you currently have against that snapshot file. I just wanted to mention it. I'm not going to show it to you because I don't want to switch branches now with, with this, you know, branch in in the works, whatever. But you can effectively effectively also compare snapshots of entities uh, against each other. All right, that is um, the way of me being a Java first programmer. So, for example, what I also have in my application properties file, I you know drop and recreate the schema now on on every um, on on every startup, and uh, right, I I don't even need to 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 talk about that uh, anymore because mentally I was already in the second way, of uh, we have Java first, and then we have database first. So what if hmm, that was quite the cut? Uh, what if we have? Um, I want to go the other way. So instead of you know adding you know these entity uh, sorry the attributes first in my entities, I want to add the fields first in my database. So for example, I could go here to my media uh, column, and let me just once by the way um, <clears throat> just quickly rerun my um, my application so the database tables get recreated. Right, that's why I wanted to show you the application properties file. In the first place, do I still ah the migration SQL file? Let me just see what we have here. Error creating bean ah right. I need to uncomment uh, Flyware also. As always, what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to give you a perfect uh, run through where there's no issues along the way. Rather, I'm, I like to show stuff uh, the way you would encounter it in real life, so that you might see the odd issue you know arriving. So let's just quickly, you know, boot up the application uh, again so that my database tables are in sync, right? And if I refresh my database here now, you can see here's my uh, media table. Here is my user table, right? That's what I wanted to show you. Now, for whatever reason, um, I'm switching development styles and I'm saying, well, uh, I just want to add a new column here in the database first. And uh, what could we have? Um, I don't know. Uh, let's just put an expires uh, database column here. An int it doesn't make any sense, but it doesn't also it also doesn't matter. Um, so we have our media uh, table, which has added a new column, and that column is not available here in my media entity, right? So I can't see it here. So I would need to have a field, getters, and setters. 
Again, don't worry about it. What you can do is, um, and this time I'm going through the toolbar, let's add a new attribute. And let's say I want to add an attribute from the database, right? So you just click from DB. Again, what you want to do is you want to um, reload your database schema. Um, and, oh, let's see if it pops up. That is actually a tiny bug. Let me just, oh, I was hoping, because I had that also in preparation, uh, you have, it's a bit unfortunate now um, that you cannot see it. Let me just try once more. But I had that hiccup in a test run, and there was a caching issue, and I had to delete a cache, which is very unfortunate. I'll try it once more. I'll say from DB. And unfortunately, you should see it here under the columns, right? Because you see all the map columns, and then here you should see the field expires, and then you could easily sync back the changes. But unfortunately, I think maybe with my specific version, there is a tiny bug. There was a tiny bug. So um, you'll just have to believe me that the field would be there, and I could sync back the changes. Sorry about that, but that's how you would go about it. Right. So in in that case, even though you didn't see it, the sync back from the database to the entity actually also works or should work most of the time. Uh, and if not, by the way, our developers are probably in the back already fixing it uh, once they see it. So it should work by the time you're trying this out. Last but not least, um, something which I didn't show you, it's not just about, um, you know, is syncing tiny attributes, for example, or single attributes back. Uh, what you also could do is effectively uh, invoke an action where you say, hey, I want to create uh, essentially all from all database tables, I want to create entities, right? So if you did the whole reverse engineering flow, you can also invoke the action, this very specific action to go from database table to entity. At the moment, I can't see any entities here because I already have entities uh, for all my database tables, so everything is in sync. But if it wasn't in sync, JPA Buddy would tell me about it, and I could do the full table reverse engineering, which is also very cool. So to sum things up here in the second block, what we had is, um, doesn't matter if you're Java first, doesn't matter if you're database first, what you can do with JPA Buddy, uh, either sync the database from your entities uh, through these uh, differential changes, or get the changes from the database and put them into your Java entities as well, back again. Second condition, uh, the second big conceptual block. If anyone still remembers the first uh, conceptual block, uh, kudos to you. I'll send them up at the back, uh, at, the, at the very end again. But now it's time to have a look at the third big conceptual block. Because so far, we've only been talking about entities and, you know, mappings and liquid-based flyway, blah, blah, blah. At some point, what you do usually in a project, you have a REST controller. And I'm just going to call it media REST controller here. I'm just going to quickly give it the REST controller annotation. And you'll have a method which is going to be a get mapping, for example, because you want um, the user to retrieve all media... <clears throat> media, so media, all media, which is in the database, right? So you're going to have a method which looks a bit like that. And um, here you're just going to return a list, for example, or a stream, a collection, whatever have you, of media. Note that I wrote object here. The question is, why did I wrote object here? Because usually you don't return your entities, the full entities, you return DTOs. And not only that, we only wrote the controller now, but we also need a repository. At least if you're using uh, Spring Data, for example, it's common practice to have for every entity a repository. And by the way, you could check out my, uh, my, my live stream with the creator of Hibernate, Gavin King, uh, last month uh, about his views on, on you know, uh, having these repositories or if there's alternatives. But for now, most projects... Um, use that repository pattern. So we also need a repository with a query. We need a DTO. We need mappers. Uh, we need all that custom code. And actually, I don't want to write that custom code. And now, let's see what um, JPA Buddy gives me. Because what I can do is, I can just start typing media. Uh, I did it here with an uppercase M. And um, so to reference the type, my media entity, and I get a couple of cool auto-completions here. 
For example, let's say um, I want to write a new media find query because I want to return a, coles a collection of media. And here in the autocomplete, I can see, hey, um, yeah, let's do a find, and I create a repository class and a method for you. Well, let's let's try it out what happens. So I just click Enter, and then JPA buddy tells me, hey, but you need a new Spring Data repository for your entity because there is none yet. Uh, I'm going to call it Media Repository. Yeah, then <laughs> good luck in, you know, whatever, finding the right repository here, JPA repository, ListCrowd repository. I'm just going to go with the default. I'm going to put it into a specific package. That's fine. I'm just going to go with the default. Uh, I'm just going to click OK. Now, let's see. Um, you could say, hey, um, do I want to do a find all? Well, do I want to do a find by? No, I want to do a custom find. Do I now want to find one instance, so just one tiny media object, or do I want to find a collection? I want to find a collection. And again, we're back in my visual query designer, where it says, hey, do you want to return a list to set a collection? I'm just going to go with the list here. Uh, we want to return a list of media. And uh, the query conditions, I'm just going to repeat them uh, from, from, from early on. So file name, for example, starts with ignore case. And uh, what did we have? Creation date, right, uh, is less than something. I'm just going to go OK. And then I suddenly get that perfectly spelled out uh, Spring Data uh, method. And I always mix these up or mess these up, rather. So find by file name starts with ignore case and creation date less than. Ooh. Uh, I'm just going to put a bogus file name in here. So file name and some local date time. Uh, local date time now, for, for example. And um, that returns me. That just created a new repository with that method. And I, had, I didn't have to fumble around. Now we that returns me a list of media. But remember, I said, hey, I want to have a list of DTOs. So I'll just go dot again, and I'll find a map to action. I'll just, I'll just click it. Now, the thing is, there's a couple of libraries out there that let you, I mean, you could write custom code, which is fine, which you can also do here in JPA Buddy. So custom Java code to map between entity and, and, uh, and a DTO. Or you could use a library or a framework like MapStruct, which I'm using here, or Model Mapper. Again, multiple choices, whichever you're using in your project, JPA Buddy supports it. I'm going to go with MapStruct here. Um, I want to um, map between media and a DTO, which doesn't yet exist. So I'm just going to quickly create it. Again, I see a new window here. It says, hey, let's create a new DTO. I'm going to call it media DTO. It should be a Java record. And it has, let's say, two fields. It has hash and, hash and file name. I'm just going to go OK. Yeah. And if you know MapStruct or if you don't know MapStruct, you need to have a mapping interface. Uh, it's, again, so a, bit, a tiny bit of boilerplate code to be able to map between these two. Again, it doesn't exist yet. Uh, so I'll just let JPA Buddy create it for me, a so-called media mapper. And then JPA Buddy, at the end of the day, asked me, hey, um, should I also maybe just, because at the end of the day, uh, we have uh, a list of media coming back. How should I convert that to a list of media DTO? Should I just use stream.map or a specific mapper method? No, I'm just happy with stream.map. I'm going to click OK. And now let's see what happened. Let me just here convert that, like so. As you can see, is we get... Um, the list of media back, and we map every media object we get back with the media mapper to a DTO, and at the end of the day, return, returned as a list. And that is what I mentioned. Actually, now I can you know call it here media DTO, and maybe I'll just show you the classes just quickly. Media DTO is just a record, has a hash and a file name that got created. The media repository you talked about earlier, also just got created. It's just a, a good old um, Spring Data uh, repository that's here. Um, the Media Mapper class was created. And MapStruct, by the way, um, works with an annotation processor. So once I start compiling the project, and that hopefully works, I'll, I'll automatically get a, um, uh, an implementation created for this interface. Right here it is. 
where you can see once we pass in uh, media objects, we just we just create a new media DTO with that Java code that was automatically generated generated for me. And I didn't have to do anything. I just went into my uh, controller. I started out with a type and I said media repository dot created a new repository or reused an existing one, created a method, uh, created a DTO, created a DTO mapper, uh, wrapped everything up in, in working Java code. And that is a very huge, huge, huge relief whenever it comes to working with uh, entities and spring data, at least in my world, right? Okay, so I showed you this. Let's show you a couple tiny things more uh, around that. So you've seen it once. Uh, again, I could show you 10,000 uh, features, just a couple of them that you might find uh, helpful. When I go to my repository, some people, by the way, myself included, uh, have, sometimes I hate these long method names and they have to be perfect. And then they have to, if there's an error, you boot up your application, you get the, the, an error message, blah, blah, blah. You could also just alt enter the method name and say extract JPQ, jpql query and configure i'll tell you what happens now we can shorten the method name so we could just say for example uh this method has the great name of abc now right clean code and we want to use name parameters let's click ok what happened uh jpa buddy uh, renamed the method it um created a JP, uh, a J, uh, sorry, an HQL query or JPQL query in that case, uh, put it into the query annotation, and uh, that's it. Yeah, you just cleaned up the code a tiny bit. Uh, you have the, the HQL, um, and you don't have to you know, rely on the method name. Um, again, the string data method name. It's just these tiny helper features that are available at every place where you can, you could just try it out, alt enter on, you know, uh, repository methods, alt enter on the entities, wherever you have something that has to do with entities, DTOs, repositories. In case, by the way, there's something else which I find quite cool. I have my media entity at the moment and we have one DTO. And um, imagine I had another DTO. So, for example, what I could do is I could say, hey, let me just quickly create a new DTO with the sensible name of media DTO2. And for whatever reason, it has file name and creation date, right? It uses the same mapper class. Let's just quickly create it, right? And uh, so here we go. So uh, this is media DTO2. You can see it has a file name, a creation date. Uh, same with the media DTO. Uh, it has hash file name. That's the one we created earlier. Sooner or later, at some point in your project, there comes the stage where, for example, you went into your media entity and said, hey, I have a new field. That field is called private string, um, I don't know, author. For example, we have getters and setters. And by the way, did you just see me add this? Well, I think with local, with these basic types, I was quick enough to do it myself. I could have also done it with the, with the, with the panel or with one of the actions, with the available actions. Um, uh, to, to be fair. So now I have the author, a new author field, and I want the author to end up in my DTOs. Now again, do I need to remember my DTOs? Do I need to remember my field and add this manually to every single DTO? No, I don't have to. Again, what I can do is I can um, use a specific JPA body action, which says add attributes to DTO. JPA body tries to keep track of the DTOs in my project. I'll tell you how in a second. And you can see here's a window where it says, hey, I have two DTOs, a media DTO and media DTO2. They have these fields, hash and file name, and they have file name and creation date. And now they also want an author and another author um, field. I just click OK, and suddenly my DTOs have that author field. And if I renamed that, let me just try that now. Um, I'm just going to give it a new name. So authors, for whatever reason, I'll just click OK. Um, that is also renamed in my DTO. So your entity and the DTOs are actually in sync. Ma matters a lot if, for example, you change the field name and then something breaks and now you don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. Now you might be wondering, how does that linking work between these the entities and DTOs? Um, the linking works uh, two ways. 
simple algorithm. If you have um, classes which are called media DTO, for example, then, well, we, uh, we pick it up and say, well, it looks like it's going to be a DTO <laughs> for your media entity. But there's also this java.comment. comment, and that java .dot comment, in any case, you could you know rename that class to anything you like, as long as you have the java .dot comment, uh, the entities and the DTOs are linked. And by the way, you can create DTOs not just for entities, but literally for any object uh, that you have, or for any class rather, uh, you have uh, lying around in your project. Now, uh, what else do we have? Let me just have a quick look because I think. I could be talking about, yes, we want to use Spring Data Projections, but I'm not going to worry about that for now. Uh, because as we saw repositories, we saw all, all the stuff you could do. I think for the third block, uh, that already is kind of good to, good to go. Uh, good to go. Uh, in terms of, we had the coding assistant I mentioned at the very beginning with Mala, where all the boilerplate, again, re uh, repetition, repositories, DTOs, um, finer methods, not just finer methods, but every repository method. Um, everything basically can be created out of the box with just a couple of keystrokes and a couple of dialog windows. What I didn't show you is a ton of things. Uh, for example, as I mentioned at the beginning, at the moment we have, uh, no, I didn't mention that. We created everything as Java classes. If it was a Kotlin project, you could actually also switch to creating Kotlin classes and Kotlin entities. If, and I'm not trying to get into that war, if you had Lombok on your class path, you could also enable all your entities or create your entities uh, with Lombok specific annotations. I know some people hate it, some people don't, some people use it. Again, JPA Buddy, you know, works with uh, all of these uh, languages, as mentioned, Java, Kotlin, um, tools, and that's called tool like Lombok. I said liquid-based flyway, pure SQL scripts uh, with Spring Data, with different um, uh, DTO libraries or mapping libraries, MapStruct, Model Mapper. Just keep that in mind. Everything you might be, 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 be using is probably supported. Last but not least, a topic which hopefully I can just quickly show you um, is there are these, you know, a ton of inspections and hints and, you know, warnings, for example, when a mapping is inefficient and you could use a better annotation and, and whatever. But I'm not going to show that to you. Uh, most of the stuff you'll just have to explore for yourself. I just wanted to show you one thing. And I'm just going to boot up the application now. Um, and um, with the uh, Hibernate or with the JPA DDL state set to validate, meaning... Now I don't drop my database schema on application startup, but I actually just validate that my database schema matches my entities. And I just wanted to show off another smart feature, one of the many smart features that JPA Buddy has, because JPA Buddy actually um, scans also the uh, the stack traces here in your log, and you can see schema validation missing column authors in table media, and once you click it, what well, you can see we can generate you know, the DDL by entities uh, where we can again say, hey, please generate me the SQL scripts uh, that I need uh, to have uh, that specific, um, uh, the author's table available in my, uh, sorry, the author's column available in my media table. Super cool. Um, that works with stack traces. Uh, there's also other features where I'll just give you the hint. Uh, no, actually, I, I don't give you the hint. What you need to do is you need to go onto the JPA Buddy website later on. I'm going to show it to you in a second and have a look at the documentation and the videos. There's a ton of videos about all the JPA Buddy features out there uh, that you might find useful. Now, I'm nearing towards the end of what I wanted to show you. I'm happy if you just take away that JPA Buddy, try it out tomorrow in your project, Try it out uh, where, for example, you want to you know, change a mapping or you maybe want to create a new repository method. Then I'm already happy. And uh, other than that, if you remember just a couple of features I showed you in this webinar now, uh, I'm also happy. And you can also, by the way, as always, and I think you have been uh, asking a ton of questions already um, in, the, in the chat. And uh, let's maybe see if there are any uh, outstanding questions left for our webinar uh, in the last 10 minutes. Uh, that I or Andre can help answer. Let's see. Andre, can you come on screen and help me out maybe? 
Or actually, tell me about the state of the questions in the channel, because I'm not sure. I, I was just literally babbling now for 50 minutes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you for the awesome uh, speech, Marco. It was great. It was a great You're presentation. Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, uh, I think that all the questions are answered. Uh -huh. Andre, uh, before you both start answering the question, let me uh, quickly add uh, a link to the feedback for the session. Everyone who's watching uh, the session, please submit your feedback. I'm also posting a link on uh, the chat uh, here so that if, uh, so they, we know what you feel about the session and we could improve our sessions in the future as well. Now I will take this off and I'll let you answer the questions. Of course, Marco, yeah. a great session. Yes. Thank you. I, go ahead. Thank you very much. So uh, the only question that is remains unanswered is regarding the the uh, reverse engineering from a foreign account from a foreign schema in Oracle. And I don't have Oracle right now at my uh, in my Docker container, but I would suggest to create two links and um, import data from, from the another link. So uh, Malik, can you share my screen, please? Uh, yes. So bringing up your, yes, now Fantastic. your Thank screen you. is on the screen. So a GPA body can work with different database connections. And I have uh, in my ID two database connections. One is for pet clinic and another one is for post career database. And Let's assume that I want to import test table uh, data into my uh, application, into my entity. So uh, GPA body can import data from foreign connections. So basically what I have done, I, I have created two connections, one for pet clinic and one for Postgre. And when I say I want to create a new GPA entity from the database, I can select a connection from here and you see, if I select Postgre, I can see my, my test table and I can import it into my application. So yeah, I just need to create this, this uh, table. So this is basically it. Uh, so if you have additional questions regarding importing data or working with multiple data sources from the Spring Boot application, please let us know in, in, in the ticket. But as for the import, uh, GP body can, can do everything for you. And even more, it can just generate additional columns for, for you if you forget something in your, in your, uh, in your application. Mm -hmm. So basically that's it. Hope I answered the question and you can just reuse those multiple connection ability to import data from different schemas and use them in your application. Thank you. Mala, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks for that, Andre. I'm remo removing your screen from the stream. Let me know if you want me to uh, add it to the stream again. So um, I see that you've already answered uh, all the other questions. Uh, so if anyone wants to add uh, ask follow-up questions, please do that now, because if you don't get uh, more questions, I would close the stream. And um, a quick question, Andre, um, I know you would be getting this question often uh, about using custom type mapping and Hibernate types library from Vlad, because I know a lot of people follow uh, him. Yeah. So, so does JP Buddy already support that? Yeah, we do support hibernate types, actually. And we, if you have it in class path, we can detect those types and suggest those uh, data types in, in, our, uh, in our wizards. So yeah, we do support it. And I, I just want to add, I was myself surprised. I mean, you saw it in the, in the, in the presentation with how many libraries and frameworks JPA buddy works with together. It, it is surprising. So. Uh, uh, yeah, just wanted to add that once more. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and another question, if you are good to answer, Andrew, because we do have a couple of minutes. Uh, so what about the entity graphs? 
Oh yeah, this is the feature. I, I think it, it was the most expected feature in the GPA specification, Entity Graphs. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we have a nice visual wizard for Entity Graphs. And as soon as you click on your uh, GPA repository method, you can just, mm -hmm. in the palette, you can just create the Entity Graph that you want to use in your mm -hmm. query. So yeah. Right, so, so you just mentioned that one of the most uh, demanded features. So do you already have a roadmap for the next set of features that are coming in? So we basically uh, have a roadmap for supporting Hibernate 6 even better than we, ha we do have now. So we probably mm -hmm. add more inspections which are Hibernate 6 specific because there were some changes there and, uh, for example, uh, the um, graph routing is, is a bit different in Hibernate 6, 6 so we are going to um, add the warning if you are usually using suboptimal sub optimal queries in the uh, in the uh, mm -hmm. JP code. So yeah, we we do we do have the roadmap. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't think we have more questions. We do just a moment. As soon as we say, uh, okay, <laughs> so that the thank you messages. So let me show some of those messages. So we have the session was really helpful. Uh, thank you guys. Marco is totally the code. I don't know. If the, the greatest time. of all the greatest of all time. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the greatest of all time, but thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> So, so uh, people are looking forward to watch more of your content. Marco, uh, Ricardo says, really awesome. Um, Ritunja says, really a great tool. And there were a couple uh, on top as well, which I'm missing or which I didn't mark. So um, thank you so much. Um, I think that was a great session, Marco. And thank you so much, Andre, for answering all the questions. And I missed saying that Andre is working with JetBrains and he develops a lot of tools and plugins and a lot of other things as well. So thank you, Andre. Thank you, Marco. Thanks. And of course, of course. Thank you very much. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you for watching everyone and uh, have, know, a, have a nice we, day. We, we still need closing comments from uh, you. We, we, we can't close the stream now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can't, we can't close the stream now. Uh, yeah. what should I say? Uh, okay, closing comments. No, it was a pleasure. Hopefully you learned something. I have, unfortunately, I have no equivalent to, to the Marco codes at the end of the session, uh, but I'll see you all in the next session. I'm very much looking forward to it. And thank you, Andre, for you for answering the questions. Thank you, Mala, uh, for, for hosting the thing. And um, it's been a pleasure. What should I say? Thank you so much. Um, Andre, any closing comments from you? Thanks very much for attending the uh, attend the session, the session. Thank you, Marco, for a great presentation. And yeah, looking forward for uh, you using our product. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, I, everyone watching the session. It was great. Uh, everyone joined us today. And I hope you learned a lot of things from this session. And uh, stay tuned for our next episode, which would be uh, in December first week, uh, I believe. And that's going to be a good one, a great one. So, so keep, uh, stay tuned. And until next time, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Hello again.